Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Breen Bible Church, Grace Life Church. Again, we're located in Evansville, Indiana. And if you have any comments or anything, that's my phone number. Uh, please text me. Don't call unless it's really important, but texts are better. Um, we have a website, gracelifeunleashed.com. YouTube is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. Facebook, Grace Life Church and or Breen Bible Church. We have a Rumble account. And if you get on the website or you get on Facebook, the videos refer you back to YouTube. So if you get on YouTube, please um, um, subscribe. And if you want to like it and hit the alarm bell, that works too. Um, again, Wednesdays we have a, a podcast that I record at home, Grace Life Unleashed podcast, uh, playing chess in a checkers world. So that's just online on YouTube and Rumble. We're going to continue on today in Ephesians. Again, I, I love Ephesians. I, I think... Romans is a good starter book. You've got to understand Romans in order to, to live the grace life because it, it gives us all the, I guess you could say the preliminary stuff, the basic stuff, but Ephesians is probably a little more advanced. Um, they're assuming you're saved. They're assuming you understand the fundamentals, and now it's going to build upon that. So we guess you could say grade school, middle school. You know, the Bible is not... You know, there, there's, the Bible's like an onion. You peel one layer away and there's another layer there and you can study the same verse year after year after year and see things like, oh, I didn't see that because it's just that good of a book to study. But Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and, and I, I love what Denny taught me is that Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is followed by verse 10. <laughs> and, and I appreciate that because a lot of times we quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and we don't quote 10 because as grace believers we don't want to put works in salvation, but works is after salvation. It's something that God desires from us, not that we just get saved and go on living a carefree life and just live willy-nilly, although some people do. <laughs> but Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And when you talk to people about salvation, Always, always, you know, and there's other verses you can use too in Romans, but Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, I think, are just a, the best two verses to use. And then, you know, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, and that's even like we're, we're God's trophy. He's that proud of us. Created in Christ Jesus, what? Unto good works with God before ordained that we, there's that word, should. This should different than would or will. Yeah, so it's God's desire that we should, you know, um, <clears throat> walk in them and good works. But it's not a requirement for salvation or to maintain your salvation. It's an attitude of gratitude because of what Christ did for us when he died on the cross that we think we'd want to do something good back, I guess you could say. Now Paul is going to remind them where they came from. Okay, he says, Wherefore, remember that ye that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by them which are called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. Now remember, when you go back and look at the Old Testament, God called the nation of Israel out. Remember Mount Sinai, and he made them, he, he sprinkled blood on them, and he read them the law, and he said, you're going to be a peculiar people, and you're going to be a nation of priests. That's what Moses told them. Now, I said this before, if the entire nation is a priest, okay, and priest is an in-between person, they go in between God and man, they're, they're the in-between people. If the entire nation of Israel is a nation of priests, who are they going to? It's not themselves. Gentiles. Gentiles. So there always was a plan of salvation for the Gentiles. Every dispensation, um, well, I guess Adam and Eve, there weren't other people there, but basically every, there always was a plan. The problem was there was no follow-through. And so when Christ came back to the earth, remember he made these comments like, I came but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Well, the reason he didn't go to Gentiles was because he wanted the Jews to go to the Gentiles. And when the Gentile woman came to him, even though he was like snobby and didn't give her any attention, the reason he didn't was because that's what the Jews were. And after he talked to that Gentile woman, remember he said that her faith was greater than all of those in Israel? Because she got it. She understood their message better than they did. So the Jews were so always supposed to go to the Gentiles, but they didn't like the Gentiles, okay? Um, I've given these examples before. The reason Jonah jumped in his ship and went the other way wasn't that he had these, you know, 
didn't want to listen to God, but God told them to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh was full of what? Ninevites. That was God, that was Israel's enemy. Why would you want your enemy saved? Okay? You want them all to die and go to hell. I mean, that, that's what you want. And that's what, you know, Noah's thinking, or Jonah's thinking was, I don't want these people saved. And then you read the whole account. It's a great account of God's grace and God's mercy. He spends three days inside of a fish, okay? And then he gets spit out, and then he goes, all right, I'll go, okay? <laughs> because he didn't want to have God double down, I think. <laughs> How do you think Jonah looked when he walked into Nineveh? You think he was wearing a three-piece suit and hair was slicked back real nice? And What do you think happened to you? You're inside of a fish for three days, Denny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was half digested. His clothes was probably all ripped. So he walks around town. This was his huge town. I think I should have looked at it. I think it took him three days to walk around town. And these people were all repenting. Now, I think it's some half dead guy. You know, I guess it was one of the first walking dead shows before they really became popular. <laughs> Starts walking through town and says, Hey, you guys got to repent or God's going to destroy you. He probably made a good walking example of somebody who got their attention, of somebody who was like, crazy in the sense where, okay, this guy means, 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 means what he says. And the whole city repented, and God didn't destroy him. And what was Jonah, Jonah's attitude? I knew you were going to do that. I knew you were a God of mercy and long-suffering. I knew you were going to do that. And he's mad at God because the people aren't going to be destroyed. <laughs> because Jonah wanted his enemy dead. And, and as we talk to people about Christ, would you have the ability or want to go to your worst enemy, okay, and tell them about salvation? You kind of wonder. Well, that's what Israel was facing. They did not like Gentiles. They thought they smelled, and they weren't really good people. And God sent them to the Gentiles. So there always was a plan of salvation to the Gentiles. But when he starts talking about this, when Paul's talking about this, this is what the Jews thought of the Gentiles. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. I don't think there were very many Gentiles saved during the entire time from you know, Mount Sinai all the way to when grace was started. I really don't. But that wasn't God's fault. God had a plan. It was Israel's fault. So the whole idea of Gentiles being saved in spite of Israel is going to, are supposed to make the Jews jealous too, you know that? Because as the Jews look at the blessings that the body of Christ has, they're supposed to go, hey, some of those are our blessings. Why, why, why did they get them? And it was supposed to create jealousy among the Jews. It's kind of like when, if you have little kids, and another kid comes over and starts playing with your kid's toys that they haven't touched in six months, all of a sudden that kid is like, what? That's mine, and I want it right now. You know, and they have this big fight about, you know, why this kid's playing with his toy that he doesn't even care about. Well, as the Jews were supposed to look at the blessings coming to the nation, or the body of Christ, they were supposed to get jealous and was supposed to shape them up. But instead, what did they do? They killed Stephen, and uh, they tried to kill Paul. And, you know. That's why I think Paul thought that the rapture was going to occur during his lifetime. He thought maybe the Jews would get aggravated enough that they would come around, but instead they just pushed away farther, and then God set them aside. So, the grace is kind of, um, oh, we're not the replacement for Israel, but it's a continuation of people being saved. But now, and that's how we live today, in the dispensation of but now, which signifies a difference in Christ Jesus, which is what the body of Christ is, you who sometimes, or used to be, afar off, are made nigh or close by the blood of Christ. So now we're, we're part of the club, okay? For he is our peace, who hath made both one. Now what are the both? The both are Jew and Gentile. Both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now this reference here is something that, if you were a Jew, you knew exactly what in the world Paul was talking about. It's kind of like, my, my issue with the, the um, spiritual gifts, in a sense, to where we have the armor of God, is the example Paul uses is a Roman soldier. Okay? Now, when's the last time you were walking around town and you saw a Roman soldier in full battle armor? Anybody? No? 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 We don't even have occupied America, you know, where someone's walking around with guns and stuff. But to the Jews that were reading... 
Paul's example, it was common day things because Rome occupied Israel. And they saw soldiers all the time. And so they could relate very well to what's going on. So again, every illustration breaks down at some point. But the example Paul gave was great at that time, but sometimes a little bit different. So when I read the middle wall of partition, when's the last time you hung out at the temple in Jerusalem? That's not even there anymore. Tip a wall, you know. You didn't. So this doesn't make any sense to you. But if you were to look in Jerusalem, um, actually we're going to get that in a second. I guess I've got to read what happened first. There was a, as you went into the temple, anybody could go in the first part. It was kind of like the common gathering area. But then there was a wall, and we're going to get to that slide, and there was a sign that said, if you're not a Jew and you cross to the other side of this wall or go through this door, we're going to kill you. Okay, because only Jews were allowed. So when Paul makes the comment, you know, that he's broken down that middle wall, what he's saying is there's no difference in under grace between a Jew and a Gentile. Now, yeah, they, there is. I can still tell you where Israel is. I can still tell you where the Jews are. But it has to do with God's program. God does not deal with the Jews differently today as he does the Gentiles. We're on the same level. I don't need a Jew to get saved, Okay. I don't have to grab the skirt of a Jew and say, take me to your God. I don't need them as priests. We have our own access to God through Jesus Christ. That's the difference. They're, this whole program is gone in regards to Jew and Gentile. As a Gentile, if I wanted to be saved under the kingdom program, I had to go through Israel. Now, the word we always use is proselyte. You know, I become a kind of Jew, okay? I relate to the Jews. I agree with the Jews. I start practicing Judaism, we'll say. Am I a Jew? No. I'm a proselyte. <laughs> okay? You're never a Jew, but you are identified with them, so now you're saved as a proselyte. Okay? You're always going to be a second-class citizen. You're always going to be a dog. You're like, well, that doesn't sound like much fun. But as a proselyte, as a dog, how many blessings do you get compared to the Jews if you understand what God's doing? Every single one. You get all the blessings. As long as you understand, the blessings go through Israel, they then come to you as a Gentile. If you want to get rid of Israel and try to do it on your own, well, read the end of Revelation, <laughs> and God's going to hurt you. Okay? And that's all they had to understand. But a proselyte, is, 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 you're saved, but you're not still a Jew. Okay. Now, back in Acts 21, this is when Paul walked on the other side of the wall of partition. And they wanted to kill him. Now, the thing about it is what they're going to accuse him of is taking Gentiles on the other side of the wall, which never happened. But they didn't care. They wanted to kill him. So they made this stuff up. Paul took the men. Okay, remember, Paul went back into Jerusalem in Acts 21. And the question that the Jews had was, hey, we heard that you're telling Jews not to circumcise their kids. And Paul's like, I'm not telling the Jews that. The Jews still have to circumcise their kids. And again, we have two programs going on. When grace started, God did not tell the Jews that they were now under grace. Forget the law. No, no. He said, Jews, you're still under the law. He told the Gentiles they weren't under the law. They didn't have to become proselytes. They didn't have to practice the law. They were saved by grace, which was faith plus nothing. So Paul goes back to Jerusalem, and James is like, we got a problem, Paul. Everybody thinks you're telling Jews to give up the law and to not circumcise their kids. So James says, I want you to prove it. They're still under the law. I want you to put yourself back under the law, Paul. Hang out with these guys, shave your head, take this oath, and prove to them that they're still under the law. And that's why Paul did that. So Paul took these men the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of the purification until the offering should be offered for every one of them. So he gets back involved in these rituals. Now again, as a grace believer, can you put yourself under the law? I don't care. Yeah. If you think it works for you, go for it. But guess what? Don't tell me that. Okay? And there are people that tell me, especially like the food laws, they, they like them. Okay? I know a lot of grace believers that think tithing is relevant. Okay? Hey, more power, if more grace believers tithed, tithed did, we'd have probably nicer churches. <laughs> you know, so there's something to be said by that. But don't think you need that to be saved and don't put that on others. But you're free to do what you want. You know, it, it's, your, it's your decision. So Paul voluntarily does it to show them, not for his salvation, but for theirs, that they are still under the law. Okay? And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were in Asia, 
when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, this is the man, that'd be Paul, that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place and further brought Greeks, that would be Gentiles, also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. The holy place would be the other side of the wall where only Jews could go. Now, did Paul do that? No. But when you get a mob scene and you get a riot going, you just kind of just make stuff up and say it. Now, Paul was there. He had taken Jews on the other side, but most people didn't know that. And so these guys are purposely trying to get the people stirred up because they don't like Paul. And they have been, and they have been seen before with him in the city, uh, Tremulthus and Ephesians, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Again, this is all made up. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together and took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they were about to what? Kill him. Well, that's a pretty quick judgment. Whatever happened to due process, okay? Um, well, when you get involved in mob scenes and gang scenes, um, but that's what the people wanted, the, the, the bad people, we'll call them, okay? Tithings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Now, I don't know what band was playing. That, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> who occupied Rome? Now, who occupied Israel? Romans did. When Rome came into Israel, they told the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the priests, they said, we'll let you guys stay in power, okay? But you have one job. What's, what's the job? Keep the people in line, okay? We're not going to be overthrowing the government. Rome's in charge. You get out of line, we're just going to take you out. In 70 AD, what happened? Rome came in, took them out. Tore the temple down, took them out, okay? So these guys go, hey, uh, we got a problem down there. So they run down to the temple, basically. They took soldiers and the Tessarians and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. They're killing him. They're going to kill him, okay? Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done, okay? And some cried one thing, some another among the multitude, and when he could not know the certainty of the tr true amount, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. Get him out of here. Take him back to the, you know, wherever you want to do. All right. If you were to go into the temple, and some people say this sign actually never appeared, I, I don't know, but most people say it did. You, you can go where you want, okay? This is what that sign supposedly said at this gate or this wall. It says, no foreigner. What's the definition of a foreigner? Non-Jewish person, okay? Um, I do not think a proselyte was allowed to cross on the other side. They're still not a Jew, okay? May enter within the Ballstrat, who helped me pronounce that, um, around the sanctuary. What was the name? Balustrade. But, yeah, there you go, Balustrade. Um, a sanctuary and enclosure. Whoever is caught on himself shall be put blame for the death which will ensue. <laughs> Doesn't that sound a little bit <clears throat> like you don't want to do that? Okay, that's what they accused, accused Paul of doing when he had taken these Jewish fellows to the other side and they were Jews, they were not Gentiles. So that's the issue, and uh, who knows? And again, it is, you, you walk in and um, there, there's the core of the Gentiles, and then they had the inner areas where only Jews were allowed to go. I don't know how they policed it. I don't know what they did. Everybody seemed to know everything. You tell me, okay? Now, Acts 23. Paul is grabbed. Do you remember? He's, he's not released. Because every time they want to release him, um, Paul basically is going to be killed. So we have this problem going on here, okay? Uh, Acts 23.10, And when there arose a great dissension, and the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled into pieces, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him. So this is, this is the night that Paul was arrested, I guess you could say. This is what God said to him. Be of good cheer, Paul, for thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also in Rome. Now, I think there's more going on here than we realize, okay? Because what, what, where does Paul finally end up, remember? 
he finally ends up in Rome. Now, why does he end up in Rome? He appealed to Caesar. Because as a, as a Jew, Paul had no power. Okay? The reason the Romans could, could kill Jews and not face consequences was because Jews were not people. I'm like, yeah, they were. Okay? You, you know the word that um, the Muslims throw around called infidel? Okay? You know what that means, basically? You're non-Islamic, okay? As an infidel, you're a non-person. And like, yeah, I am. No, no. As an infidel, they say we are not people. And so they can go ahead and kill us because they're not killing people. Because we're non-Muslim. Now, does that make any sense? Sorry, but it, it, that's, that's the thinking. As a Roman citizen, if you were not a Roman citizen, you had how many rights? Anybody know? None. None. They could beat you. And they could accidentally kill you. It didn't matter, okay? Well, then the question is, well, why in the world did they have to take Christ before the Roman you know, guards and the Roman hierarchy in Jerusalem before they could kill him? Because Rome made that decision, okay? The, the priest would not have needed permission from Rome otherwise to kill Christ. They would have done it on their own. But because they were told to keep the peace, don't go around killing everybody, they had to get permission, and so they went to Pilate, and he was like, oh, I don't care. And so he let them. So the issue of Paul being killed is not a problem until they find out what? He's a Roman citizen. Now, Roman citizens have rights? Yeah. It's like if you go to a foreign country and you're an American citizen, a lot of times that country isn't quite as quick to kill you because they know there's, you know, you got issues because you're American. And the same thing with America, you can, if you get arrested, you have a right to due process because you're an American. Um, and hopefully, it's not quite true anymore. If you're not an American citizen, you don't have quite the same rights in this country. Now, if you go to Mexico, and they can throw your butt in jail for how long before they want to let you out? As long as they want. You go to Iran, Iraq, all these countries, you have no rights. Why? You're not a citizen. Now, I don't know if their citizens have rights either, but you know, as an American, you have a right to you know, face your defender and things like that. Years ago, I, got a, um, a, I ran a red light in Florida. It's odd because I usually follow all the rules and laws. But <laughs> and they had cameras, okay? And there's this place in Florida, and I'm not advertising for them, called Ticket Clinic and stuff. And uh, they, they win almost every case against cameras. You know why um, cameras don't hold up in court? Because you have a right to face your accuser. Okay? You go into court, and the policeman says, I saw him run that red light. That's why I gave him a ticket. So when you go into court and say, the camera took your picture, who are you talking to? A camera. <laughs> so that's why there's not many red light cameras left anymore, because they said, you can't do that. That's against, that's, even though that I was guilty, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but cam yeah, ca cameras are not people. <laughs> they can't testify in court. So they were able to, it's a loop, loophole. But the money that these cities made from cameras was amazing. But it also caused more accidents. You know why? Because as soon as the light turned yellow, what did everybody do? slammed on their brakes, and they had all these rear-end collisions because yellow lights scared people because they, as soon as that light turned red, it took a picture. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, that's a whole other issue. <sighs> yeah. It's a good rabbit trail, yeah. All right, how, is God telling Paul to appeal to Caesar? No. But it almost, and I, I agree with you, but I think it planted a thought in his mind that don't be afraid, to, you're going to go to Rome. And that's the only way, you know, that Paul's going to end up there if he appeals. Because we're going to see is that they wanted to let him go, okay? And if, if Paul would have been let go in Jerusalem yet, what would have happened to him? They were going to kill him. They had all these plans. We're going to kill him. We're going to kill him. Hey, let's go back. Tell him you're going back to Jerusalem and we're going to hide and then we're going to kill him. And the word got back to Paul's was it nephew or something? And, and, they, and Paul went, no, no, you can't do that. So God knew what was going to happen. And I think he's telling Paul in a sense, you know, hey, don't worry. You're going to be okay. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now, if any of you ever do something like this, um, if you want to bide yourself a little more time, don't, don't put the word drink in there, okay? Just say you're not going to eat, okay? I don't know, how long can you live without eating and drinking? 
Where's my resident nurse? <laughs> what do you think? A couple weeks? Not even, Three huh? Days. Three days? Okay. What about if you, if you don't eat, you can get a little bit more. Some of us have a little extra. We can make it a little bit longer. So they actually said they wanted them dead in three or four days. <laughs> and if you haven't drank any water in four days, you're not a good fighter either. So uh, I would think they wanted it to happen pretty quick. What, what's this trying to say? These guys were serious. They, they, were, they wanted Paul dead. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. That's a good, good bunch of haters there. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now, they didn't put the word drink in this one. Okay. Now, therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though you would inquire something more and perfectly concerning him. And we, or even he, come near and are ready to kill him. Okay, so we're going to... You bring him down, and we're going to be waiting in the bushes, and then when he goes by, we're going to kill him, okay? Um, do you think this ever happened before? Yeah. yeah, yeah. How much? More than you realize, okay? And this is the religious leaders that are working with this group of people. I think they're all working together because you have to have deniability if you're a leader or something. This, this is, we want to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son, there we go, it was Paul's sister's son, Heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul came, one of the centurions, unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. And he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him, and pray me to bring this young man unto thee, who hath something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand, and when he was with him, aside privately, and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow unto the council, as though they would have inquired something somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So he knows what's going on. He's telling the Romans. And, uh, again, the Romans don't have a, a, a dog in this hunt. That's a good hunting term, right, Danny? Yeah, yeah. What do you say if you use a fishing term? Don't have a rod in the <laughs> boat? <laughs> so the chief captain then let the young men depart and charged him, See, thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things unto me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, and... Spearmen 200 and a third hour of the night. So they're going to sneak Paul out of town at night and avoid this whole thing. Paul now spends two years in custody. So this, this is all, everything just takes time, you know, Paul. And, and the reason he was not released before this is because everybody wants a bribe in Rome. And uh, Paul wasn't going to do that. But in Acts 25, this is two years later, and now when Festus was come unto the province after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him, and desired favors against him that he would send to him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. They're still trying to kill him. <laughs> but Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea, and that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them therefore, he said, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man, if there be any wickedness in him. And when he had tarried among them more than ten days, he went down into Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. And when he had come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. Again, <laughs> remember when Christ went before the, the court and they accused him of anything? And people would say something. What they lacked was more than one person, okay? Remember, under, under the law, you need, what, two or three witnesses saying the same thing. And these guys cannot find two or three people that are willing to say the same thing. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, neither against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. Okay, so Paul's like, I didn't do anything wrong. And he didn't. He had done nothing wrong at all. Even under Jewish law, he had nothing, nothing wrong. But Festus, now again, Willing to do the Jews a pleasure, ask, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? So he says, Paul, can we go back to Jerusalem? We'll have a trial. 
and we'll get this taken care of. Because in his mind, what? Paul's going to go free. Why wouldn't Paul want to go for that? Because he knew Paul didn't do anything either. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, which I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. Now remember, what was the comment made later? If Paul hadn't appealed, he would have been free. But no, he also would have been dead. And so that's why Paul appealed to go to Caesar, and he basically spends the rest of his life pretty much in jail. Now he's released here and there and stuff. Now I have my own ideas um, on what's going on. Do you think Paul would have written any of his prison epistles if he hadn't been in prison? That's kind of a goofy statement. Like, no, he couldn't have. He wasn't in prison. <laughs> I mean, it gave Paul what? Have you been spent time in prison? <laughs> Scott hangs out in prisons a lot, but he claims he's working there. Um, if you know any prisoners, what's the one thing prisoners have a lot of that you and I don't have time, right? Because you lose your t free time. So you're told when to eat and you're told when to everything, but every, probably every day you have about eight hours of probably downtime. And so when Paul was in prison, although prisons back then weren't quite as nice as they are today, um, he wrote his prison epistles. Imagine what you would be like or what the Graceman would be like without Paul's prison epistles. They were very necessary. Uh, another thing is, I think it protected Paul from his own people. Um, his own people did not like him. The people he used to work for had a lot of power. The, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests. They had a lot of power to kill people. And I think a lot of people died you know, in the name of <laughs> Judaism back then. Um, remember when Paul w was on his way to... Um, where, was, where did Paul <laughs> see the bright light? On his way to my, my brain... Damascus, yeah. When Paul, what was, why was Paul on his way to Damascus? Kill to kill Jews. Or the nice thing was he was going to put them in jail and then they would accidentally die, okay? Um, why was, why, who gave him that authority? Chief the, the chief priest. But the chief priest probably had to get permission from the Romans, right? No. I think he did. I really think he did. What, why would the Romans have agreed to that? Because Christ claimed to be what? The king of the Jews. Did the Romans like people running around saying that they're the king? No. no. Remember the sign they put over Christ's head? King of the Jews? That, that was not a compliment. That was like, anybody else want to die tomorrow? You know, they took out anybody who had any desire to overthrow the Romans. So I, I think, and again, I can't prove it, you know, I think the Romans approved of him going around capturing all these people because that was a threat to the Roman government. And they had no problem with as many they didn't care if he caught the wrong people. They're just Jews. They're not even people. So Paul had full authority of you know, the high priest, but I think he had full authority of the Roman government, too. I, was, I don't know if they would have allowed that. Okay? So um, back to Ephesians 2, grace is so much better than the law. Okay? But Paul was set up. So when Paul talks about the middle wall of partition, it meant a lot more to him probably than it does to you and I because that's why he was sitting in jail was because he supposedly took somebody who wasn't supposed to be on the other side. So grace abolishes in the flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man. So the body of Christ is made up of twain, means two, Jew and Gentile. He, he's putting them in the same, the same boat as just people. It almost is like Judaism never existed. Before Abraham, were there Jews? No. What were there? Just people, okay? And so it kind of puts things back the way they were before, where God doesn't have favorites. Now, does God have a favorite today in a dispensation of grace? Yes. Mm. Well, okay, but let, let's, let's step one. You're being, you're being picky, James. <laughs> From God's perspective today, is, somebody, is there a nation that's the head and a nation that's the tail? Hey, that's better. No, no. Under the law, there was what? Jews were the head, Gentiles were the tail. As long as you understood that, you lacked nothing. But you needed to understand the Jews are in charge. It's kind of like, you know, on the farm. I, I had a sign, actually, it said this. Rule number one, the boss is always right. Rule number two, if the boss is wrong, see rule number one. Okay? When it comes to God's dealing with Israel, Israel's number one, Gentiles are number two. Okay? Um, make himself one, and that he might reconcile both, again, Jews and Gentiles, unto God into one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereof. God does not have a favorite at all. 
And that's why you know, some people get, they get upset with me when I say, God does not treat any of us any differently than he does the other person. And some people want God, they want a favor from God. Okay, hey, God, I'm, I got this you know, health problem, and you know, I've been working really hard for you, and I, I really need to stick around, so can you just kind of heal me? I, I know you're not healing everyone, but make an exception for me because I really need this favor. Is God going to answer that? No. He doesn't make exceptions. We're all on the same page. Whereas, I think under the Old Testament law, God was making exceptions all the time. The health, the wealth, and prosperity issue. And so I think there's a big difference in those two things. And came and preached peace to you, again, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Both Jews and Gentiles today, under grace, have no separate from each other. And through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. If you don't think that's, that's a difference in, in the law, you don't understand grace. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers, now he's talking to Gentiles and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the buildings fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together as a habitation of God through the Spirit. Grace doesn't get any better because we're on the same level as Jesus Christ himself. We, we are we're the sons of God. Um, we, we are not the evil stepsister or the evil stepbrother that no one likes. We actually are part of the family and, and we have full rights and blessings as Jesus Christ himself. And it's not because of us. It's because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we, we think of our position in the heavenlies, Lord, we've been raised up to sit together. We're above the angels. We're above the principalities and the powers. We're, we're seated on the same level as Jesus himself, not because of us, but because of Christ and the love that he had and you have for us. Lord, we thank you for that blessing. Lord, we pray we don't take it lightly that we are wanting to do good works, not to get saved, but because we're saved. We thank you for that. Pray us in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Janet. One more song. Mm-hmm.